wow lecture. And the second thing is, uh, whoever wants to play uh, water polo with you to wow, can go to the gym at 6.30 tonight. But so I know you guys have a uh, talk at 6.30. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. All right, so um, before we get started, I wanted to ask, I'm going to do a, two uh, quick uh, polls. So I wanted to see how many of you are working on dark matter in one way or another. Okay, that's a pretty good, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good uh, set of hands. Um, okay, and then I also was told to say uh, happy birthday, Felix. <laughs> I heard that uh, the, the, the festivities went uh, long and hard. Who is Felix? I have no idea. Who's Felix? Is he's not here? So, yeah, okay. The, so, so the festivities yesterday. There he is. The man of the hour. <laughs> Excellent. So, so the next question I wanted to ask was, um, so how many of you are working on supersymmetry? Okay, how many of you are working on things that beyond the standard model that are not supersymmetry? Sign of the times, my friends. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to talk about, uh, so today is going to, I think, be the most technical of the three lectures where we talk about most of the experiments that are doing dark matter detection. But again, this is, the purpose is not to go into mega nitty gritty stuff, but to give you a survey kind of overview so that when you're talking with people that are doing direct detection at conference and stuff, you at least have some idea, oh yeah, I have heard about this before kind of thing, right? So that's the purpose um, of, of the lecture. So today we're going to go over WIMP, with WIMP detection technologies and where we are and where we're going. And then tomorrow we will talk about um, you know, the limits of how far we can go. We'll talk about the neutrino floor, and then we'll talk about um, electron recoil, dark matter, and axions and other coherent uh, resonant detectors like, you know, dark photons and that kind of stuff. Okay, so, um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, WIMP stuff, but before actually I'm going to take a little bit of a segue and talk about DAMA for a little bit. Now, DAMA is a, they, they build an experiment that's a model independent search for dark matter, so I can't really place it in any of these models because, you know, if you're dividing your lectures by a category of dark matter, then DAMA doesn't fit anywhere. So I'm just going to put it here in the beginning of all of the experimental stuff, right? Because it could be that if DAMA is seeing dark matter, then it could be anything. Um, so we already talked about this, so I won't go over these slides again. Uh, you, you, get, you expect some modulation that peaks are, you know, at some uh, energy low, low in kV, but that depends on the, on the actual target, the, the actual shape of that. Um, so here's the DAMA experiment. So DAMA, uh, and DAMA Libra, which Libra is the kind of the follow-on experiment, but people keep calling it DAMA. Um, they use uh, 25 radio pure crystals. Each of those crystals, so the crystals are these little blocks here, and then each of the crystals has a photomultiplier tube on either side. Um, and basically what they're looking for is scintillation uh, in these crystals. When something whacks into it, they emit light and the photomultiplier tube see it. And so they're looking at their overall rate. They subtract out the you know, mean number of events, and they get this uh, modulation, the residual modulation, um, and these are count per day, so uh, obviously they're integrating up, and they have um, uh, a, a pretty strong signal, so nobody, um, so nobody uh, disagrees that they are seeing modulation in their residuals, so this is, you know, I think it's nine sigma by now, 
So nobody disagrees that this is mod that this is a, a excess mo uh, residual that that is modulating as a function of the year. The question is, what is it? So here's the uh, the modulation amplitude um, as a function of energy. And so if you, we go back to here, right, we expect something that goes like that and then falls off because there's this little node here, right? So there's, there's that little node there, so you would expect the modulation amplitude to go to zero at somewhere. Um, so as you can see, the modulation amplitude is going up. It, it kind of has a reasonably close shape. And if they, what would make things really, really interesting is if they were able to have sensitivity to these lower bins and they saw the modulation go down, right? So if they saw the modulation go down, then that would be very, very, very interesting. Counts per day, per kilogram per kV. Okay. I mean, you know, it, so we're not saying that this is dark matter, first of all. And second of all, as I said, it depends on the target and it depends on the kinematics. You know, again, you know, you have to be careful with these plots. This is not, you know, th these, these are not standard model calculated cross sections I'm showing you. This depends on a gajillion assumptions that you make. So it depends on the velocity structure of, of dark matter. It depends on the nuclear physics of the target. You know, so it depends on how the target, you know, reacts to interactions with, with the dark matter. So it depends on the coupling method that you assume. So it doesn't have to look exactly like the green line I showed you. That's just a general behavior you expect. But, you know. Um, anyway, so the, the, um, so they have 9.3 sigma with, a, with 1.33 ton years of exposure and 14 annual cycles. Now, to date, no other experiments have been able to see the signal. And people have been trying to explain what, this, what, what model of dark matter could produce these signals. There isn't a current experiment or a current um, theory that, ha that holds up when you then compare it to all the other experiments, right? So you can come up with a model that gives you modulation. But then, of course, that model will be predictive and will say, OK, well, if this is the right model, then CDMS would have seen x, xenon would have seen blah, y, and lux will have seen you know, z, and we don't see those things. Now, there are still theories for dark matter explanations of DAMA that are, for example, electron recoil. And we'll talk about those electron recoil tomorrow. But if, for example, if, if dark matter was interacting mostly through electron recoils, then we wouldn't have seen it in these other experiments. Um, there are still then limits that you can place based on, high, you know, on, on HEP experiments and so forth. So I don't think there is a particularly good explanation. But there still is, I think, some potential for some wiggle room for an exotic dark matter candidate that could be producing this. and. We're just not looking in the right way with the other experiments that are looking for more specific cases of dark matter. So, um, so dark matter is uh, Dama Libra is still taking data. Um, the way to so you can you know basically there are two things you can do. You can cont well there's three things you can do. First of all, what would be great is if the Dama collaboration would let other people look at their experiment and their data to kind of vet out the, the, the analysis procedure. Um, that has not happened, and that's been a huge um, you know, sore point for many, many years, for a decade now, where the DAMA collaboration is very close-knit about their data, and they refuse to let other people you know, look at the data and this kind of stuff. Now, you know, my you know, Rita uh, Bernabe, who's the, the kind of the lead person in, in DAMA, um, you know, if this is dark matter, it would have been, it's going to be, it's going to break my heart that she's been fighting people for 10 years and she hasn't gotten the credit that she, sh that she would have gotten otherwise. So, you know, we'll see, but it will really break my heart if that end up, ends up being the case. Anyway, one thing you can do is look for this, um, look for the signal with the same type of technology, right? So if this is some weird thing, 
it should be a weird thing that happens whenever you have sodium iodide and you detect scintillation from sodium iodide in a detector, right? So if you're assuming that you don't know what it is and it's something weird, then one way to check is, okay, if I put a second big sodium iodide experiment somewhere and look for annual modulation, do I see the annual modulation there too? And ideally, you would do it on the South Pole because um, the problem with annual modulation is that guess what other things change with annual modulation? You know, everything, right? Because it's weather and, you know, the, the water table changes, the thickness of the atmosphere changes, so your muon flux changes, and all of those things change with the seasons with one annual modulation basis. So if you had an experiment that was on the South Pole where it is the summer when it's the winter up here and vice versa, if this modulation is due to some atmospheric or weather or seasonal thing, then there's a very good chance that it will modulate with the opposite face on the southern hemisphere than it would on the northern hemisphere, and then that would be it, right? Like if you saw the modulation and it was six months offset from Dama, then that would be the end of it, right? Um, it is hard to do, you know, so right now the only, there's a couple of, of experiments that are planning to put um, um, sodium iodide detectors in the southern hemisphere. There's a bunch that are doing, um, doing it in the northern hemisphere. So let me show you a couple of them. So there's a collaboration between several different experiments, Anais, DM Ice, and KIMS, to put together, basically uh, add up the, the mass of all of their detectors to ba make a DAMA-like uh, detector mass. Because as we said yesterday, the rate is just, you know, goes as MT, right? So as the mass times the time that you take data. So you want as much, and you're looking for annual modulation, so you want as much mass as possible. So they've agreed to share their data and co-add it together so that they have more target mass and that they think that they can um, either see or exclude um, the, these are, so this is uh, in the spin independent uh, uh, case, if th these are the two um, uh, um, regions for DAMA where you could explain it through some WIMP type interaction and with the ex uh, exposure that they're going to have, they will be able to see that modulation or excluded. Now, of course, what they're looking for really is the modulation, so that's really the important thing. Um, and they're going to start taking data sometime this year. And it'll take them two years to get enough, you know, get, get at least two cycles and see if they see something. So DMICE is a very interesting experiment, so it's, it's also a sodium iodide thing with two photomultiplier tubes, but it's stuck into the ice in Antarctica. And what that gets you is the world's most expensive muon veto, right? Because they're in the middle of this humongous neutrino experiment, and they don't, you know, they're not using it for lo looking at neutrinos. But when muons go through, those light up all of these guys. So I'm, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Ice Cube, but basically each of these is a hole in the Antarctic ice, all going all the way down to the bedrock. Here's the Eiffel Tower for scale. And then they have all these little uh, bulbs that uh, look for scintillation. And so when particles go through, they Cherenkov radiate photons out, and those photons travel through the ice. And they hit some of those photons, hits those little photon detectors, and they light up. And they they basically make a it's like a tracker, but but just at a much grand, grander scale, so they can track make a track of the particle going through the ice, and then they reconstruct energy and uh, direction and all that stuff, and they can try to do as much particle ID as they can. They can track muons very well, so basically, um, you know, you have this detector here that has all of this stuff um, around it that you can use for for vetoing events. Um, so the the detector is again the same idea. So because it's going into this big long tube, it's nice long and long and skinny. So it's just one. This is a prototype, so it's one crystal with two photomultiplier tubes, um, and then it's put at the end of one of these long cables that has the, have these photo, these are the, the DMI, uh, sorry, the, um, the normal photomultiplier detectors that look like that, called DOMs. Um, okay, so Anais is a more conventional experiment um, in Spain. 
in the Ken Frank Underground Laboratory, and it's basically a uh, attempting to to reproduce an experiment very similar to Dama. So it has the same sort of array with muon paddles around it and and shielding. Um, then Saber is trying something different, which is they have their sodium iodide and photomultiplier tubes inside of a um, scintillator, a liquid scintillator vessel. And the idea is that if you're, what you're seeing are backgrounds, you want to reduce, or you're looking for modulation, you want to reduce your overall rate as much as possible. So you're you know, subtracting a smaller, smaller number to get your residuals. And so they want to be able to tag as many of the um, events that are not WIMPs as possible, and so they're putting their, uh, their detector in a liquid scintillator uh, veto to veto out uh, background events. Okay, so that's um, basically that's the status of, of DAMA. There's basically a, a pretty big effort right now to try to check DAMA, which I think is really good. It's taken a long time to get the momentum going, but I think people are you know, with the LHC not seeing anything, you know, people are kind of like saying, well, what do we do? There's this signal there that's been claimed for, you know, years. And so I think there is a momentum now that to, to check this signal. And so I think over the next, you know, five years, we will start hearing from these experiments and we will know whether DAMA, uh, whether they're start, starting to see a modulation or not. Now, if they see a modulation, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is dark matter because especially, you know, Saber is going to be located in the same laboratory, Gran Sasso, than Dama is. So if there's some environmental thing that is modulating, like some muon flux or something that is causing the Dama modulation, then you would expect Saber to be potentially uh, 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 similarly affected, right? So it might see the same thing. Then the, I think the difference is that these experiments are much more willing to, they're basically trying to check this, and so they're much more willing to uh, look at the data and say, okay, what other explanations are there, and have other people check things. So I think even if they end up seeing a signal, there'll be a lot more scrutiny, and we'll be able to really see what's going on. So hopefully, in the next five years, we will be able to either um, you know, claim this as uh, a pretty good dark matter candidate signal, or just you know, lay it to rest and, and move on. So uh, I, I thought the DMI is also for the um, in the South Pole, so the annual modulation is the opposite. Yes, so, so this is on the South Pole. So Ice Cube is in the South Pole. So if, if the uh, signal is giving you some noise, then uh, it's able to get the South Pole. Exactly, exactly. Now, the problem is that DMI right now only has one detector, and this detector was a prototype. So they do not have enough mass, and that detector is not clean enough to really be able to do it. They need to put more experiments down, and it's very expensive to put things in the South Pole. Now, there is this thing called pa uh, Pingu that you guys might have heard of, to, which is uh, an expansion to, to um, Ice Cube. If that is funded, then, she, then the DMI's collaboration has a chance of basically tagging along, because the, the, what, what, what's very expensive is making the holes. The way they do this is they make a hole, with warm water, so the drill is actually a warm water drill, which melts the ice, and they make a hole, they put the things down there, and the, uh, the, the column is filled with water, then they stop flowing water and the water freezes. So it's not like there's a hole there and you can pull things out and put it back in, they get frozen into the ice, right? So if you want to put something else, you have to make a new hole. And m making those holes is very, very expensive, these are, you know, kilometers of holes. And so um, the, the budget for dark matter is not the biggest, but the neutrino budget is a lot bigger. So if the neutrino side gets Pingu, then they might be able to put more of these um, dark matter experiments at the end of the, of the, the lines and, and have more target mass. So we'll see. OK. Um, any other questions before we move on uh, away from Dama? Um, you have to ask them that. I mean, there isn't any 
you know, the, basically the, the argument is that people won't be able to understand the data and or misconstrue the results or, you know, so, you know, basically you're not going to know what to do with it is the argument. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So now we're going to talk about de much more definite searches for WIMPs. And uh, yesterday we talked about uh, energy being split between phonon scintillation and ionization. So now we're going to look at noble liquid detectors, which are either scintillation only or are looking in the region between both scintillation and ionization. Okay. So let's talk about a time projection chamber. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the workhorse of noble liquid detectors. So what we have here is a vat, kind of like a, the size, you know, roughly can be the size of a washing machine. And you fill it up with liquid xenon or liquid whatever. Xenon, argon, neon are the ones that people have uh, and even helium are, are the things people are, are looking at. Then what you do is you put a cathode here and an anode here. You put a field, and then you put a bunch of PMTs at the bottom, which sends photons, and a bunch of PMTs at the top. So then uh, an event comes in and whacks into the, uh, whacks into the liquid. That releases electrons and light, as we have said. And that those photons are sensed by these bottom PMTs. And you get a, a, a spike in the photons as a function of time called S1, this first signal. Now, there's a field here. And these electrons are charged, right? So the electrons will drift. Then they get to this region where there's a very high field between these two uh, grids. And they get accelerated and pulled out of the liquid. So there's some work function to pull an electron out of the liquid. The field is big enough that they get pulled out of the liquid. And then they get accelerated in the gas to a speed that they start knocking off electrons off the gas itself and ionizing the gas. Those electrons see the field and move and then knock off other electrons and they create an avalanche. Right. So you then get a whole bunch of scintillation in that top grid, which gets read out by these, uh, by, by all the PMTs, but mostly by the top PMTs. And because you are gaining amplification, because each of these electrons produces a whole bunch of photons, because you're accelerating them, you get a much bigger signal. Okay? And this is called S2. The time between these two um, is, gives you the position of the event in Z. Does that make sense? So you get the vertex position um, from, the, from the time it takes, and then the pattern on the PMTs gives you the xy, right? So if x, y, and z. Um, and then the ratio of this guy to this guy gives you discrimination between S1 and S2. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So here's a kind of cooler picture of it that it's not animated, but it gives you the idea. So you have a ton of photomultipliers here. And so when you have an event, the electrons drift and create photons, and they create a pattern. That pattern gives you a centroid in the xy. And then the time, this time, gives you z. That's what's called a time projection chamber. All right, so the time projection gives you the z. OK, so then how do you do discrimination? So here's a little bit of the atomic. Uh, details. So you have something coming in, whacking into a xenon atom. The xenon atom gets uh, excited. It recoils and hits other xenon atoms. It also ionizes some of them. And so you get a whole bunch of electrons produced. And you get ionized xenon um, atoms. These guys um, are ionized, and they can be then become uh, they, they get into an excited state, which they combine to create this short-lived molecule called a dimer. Right? So it's two xenon atoms that are excited. They're not in the ground state, but they're, the work function, the potential is such that they connect to each other for a little while. And then they, um, uh, they go to their ground state by releasing a photon. Right? And so this is the light that you see. 
if you have low field, when you create these electrons, the electrons see these ions and recombine. Right? So there's going to be, the, the electrons are going to see these ions and go and recombine with them. And so you will get a small amount of electrons left over because most of them will recombine and you'll get a bunch of light. Some of them will see the field and drift, get to the top of the grid and give you the S2 signal. If you crank up the field, then you separate them quicker so they don't have time to recombine with the xenon atoms. Does that make sense? And so if you increase the field, then you get more, a bigger arrow here, you get more S2 and less S1. Now, when you have nuclear recoils instead of an electron recoil, so if you have a nuclear recoil, then the ratio of things that you get is different, and you get more, um, you get more S1 for a nuclear recoil. All right, so this is what data looks like. So the x-axis here is the number of detected S1 photons, so that first little burst of light. And then the y is a, um, let's see, this one is, it's a discrimination uh, factor, so it's the log of S2 over S1. So the number of photons they got on the second burst of light over the first one, they take the log of that. So the, here you have a calibration signal that's a photon signal, so you're only getting gammas. My, uh, let's see. Um, so you're only getting gammas here, and this is the those blue, blue li lines are the mean of the distribution. Then you put a nuclear, uh, a, a, a nuclear like a californium source that gives you nuclear recoil. So you shoot neutrons at your target, and you get this guy. And here, this blue line is this mean of the electron signal. So you can see that the mean of the neutron signal is offset from the uh, uh, blue signal. And what they do is basically they look for WIMPs in this bottom half of the region where they are very few. So here's the mean of the neutron signal. So you can see there are very few events that from electron recoils that go below the mean of the neutron signal. So you can look for WIMPs there. Okay, so here's a, a quiz. Can you name the experiment? These are different experiments. They all exist. Um, which one is which? Uh, and, you know, this is pretty hard to tell. So this is uh, argon dark matter, xenon 1 ton, lux, and dark side 50. And the point is that, you know, this is a very good technique. And so they all look very, very similar because they all use the same principle. So if you understood the slides that we just went through and you talk to any of these people, you'll be able to have a discussion about it because they're all using basically the same technique. Okay? All right, so now let's talk about xenon. So the xenon experiment um, were kind of the first ones that started this idea of this xenon time projection chamber. Yeah? So, so basically, it's the same thing we were talking about yesterday, right? It depends on what it is. So most things are going to be either alphas, betas, or gammas, right? Like most radioactivity is going to be some photon, and those are going to live here. And you don't, the only thing that lives down here are nuclear recoils or some other thing that whacks di directly into the nucleus of the atom, like a wimp. So these, this data here is from a calibration source, right? So there's tons of neutrons going to this detector right now to take this data. But when you're taking a dark matter experiments, you basically shield your experiment so there's no neutron background. And so this region here is completely open. And I'll show you some data from a dark matter search, so you'll see. Just like in all these other things, if you have events here, that doesn't mean they're WIMPs. We can't tell that they're WIMPs. They don't have a little WIMP flag on them. But, um, but then you have to look at the spectrum, the distribution. You make a model of what a WIMP signal would look like. You can then say, OK, well, if it's a neutron from, like, for example, a radioactive screw, then that would be probably from thorium. And thorium has a particular neutron spectrum. And then you can look for that. right? So there are things you can do once you have a signal 
to try to distinguish a, it from a dark matter signal. At the end of the day, the real way to do it is to have a second experiment see the same signal, preferably with a different target, so that then you can look at the ratio of the signals and see if everything starts to make sense. So it's not like you see a couple of events and you can claim a discovery. You have, you, you'll have, you know, this is, it, it's a lot harder than, for example, getting up, uh, you know, and even in the LHC, right? Like we have the 750 GeV excess and people are like, right? And, and even if the two experiments are still seeing it, they're still, so it's the same thing, right? You see a signal that doesn't mean you claim discovery. You have to keep on taking data, analyzing it, you know, it takes a while. I, ideally, you have several separate independent experiments seeing it, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? Ah, yes, thank you. I should have said that. So this is the number of detected photons. It is not energy. So these lines are lines of um, uh, same energy in this space. So when you have, for example, a 21 keV nuclear recoil, it, can, it, it will generate events in this line. Right? So this is not energy. Energy is like this. And it's just because it's a nonlinear system, so, you know. So those are the calibrations. So this is the energy in electron recoil. This is the energies in nuclear recoil. Um, so, OK, so if you had, for example, a gamma line from a photon source, then it would make a band that looked like that. If, if that's if it's a monoenergetic gamma. If it's a nuclear, if it's neutrons, which are going to have a new, uh, uh, an exponential uh, spectrum, so then you'll get some blob. And you have to model the blob to see you know, what exactly it'll do. OK, so Xenon were the guys that started this, the Xenon experiment, with their 10 kilogram um, experiment. Um, then they are now operating Xenon 100. Um, and they've just started operating Xenon 1 ton, which is a bigger version of this. These guys are starting to take data now. Well, they're starting to, to, um, to cool down their experiment. Um, they're projected to have results in a couple of years. And when the results come out, these guys will be the world leading limit in high mass uh, WIMP searches. So here's the Xenon experiment. It's a pretty, so here's a person. This building has several floors to it, and it's been very nicely covered in glass, so you can kind of see into it. And then this is the tank, the water tank, and inside that, that's a, there's a water uh, Cherenkov uh, veto there, and inside that tank is the xenon experiment. So that, this guy right here is this guy. And their idea is that they made this vessel so that they can increase the mass of xenon that they have from one ton to sort of seven tons. So that's the n ton um, um, experiment. Um, yes. Yeah, so the so a, a big part of the xenon program. So if you look at this building, there's a bunch of stuff here. And you know, this is a xenon tank to store gaseous xenon. And this is kind of gas handling stuff. But a lot of it is a purification plant to get krypton and other impurities out of the xenon uh, experiment. One of the issues with these type of experiments is that you're building a big, big experiment. And you can't really know what the final background numbers are going to be until you're actually running it. But they've done a lot of, I mean, because, as you can see, these things are not, you know, they are basically going in a very clear progression. So you can say, OK, what did we learn from Xenon 100? And can we project what the backgrounds are going to be for Xenon 1 ton? So we'll see what happens. There are issues with backgrounds because you have a vat of liquid, right? So if there's an impurity, it's going to start floating around. And it can generate events in the middle of your detector where you might be looking for WIMPs. Um, but they have a lot of, you know, a lot of their um, R&D is to get the cleanest xenon that they can. And so we'll see how well they do once they start taking data. This is at, at Grand Sasso. 
Um, so they, as you know, they're doing all the gas handling systems. They already finished that. Uh, they filled the cryostat with 800 kilograms of xenon, um, and basically they're gonna, you know, they're they're basically starting to take data this year. So it'll be, uh, they say March 2016. So you know, hopefully right now they're actually starting to to turn things on. So we'll see what happens. It'll be a couple of years before they they get a result. And then they've made this big cryostat in the water Cherenkov so that they can actually install a bigger version of xenon called xenon enton inside the same big uh, stainless steel cryostat so they don't have to rebuild all of that stuff. So the idea is that they'll run xenon one ton for a couple of years. Once they hit their backgrounds, you know, there's going to be some residual backgrounds. Once you hit those, then it's a lot better to start uh, a bigger experiment with a lot more mass, and so then the idea is that they would then uh, swap in a bigger version um, with six tons of, of uh, xenon. And then kind of looking at getting all the way to the neutrino floor, the xenon collaboration in general is working on this project called Darwin, which is, you know, Mongo uh, time projection chamber, so now 50 tons, of xenon, and that guy is is expected to be able to get sensitivity down to about the neutrino floor. Now here are, so we were talking about this yesterday, here is the ability of xenon, of Darwin, of an experiment this big, to reconstruct mass for a given WIMP signal. So in this uh, plot, they assume that you have WIMPs with a cross-section of 10 to the minus 47, and then they have different uh, masses, and these I think are the number of events that they're going to see in their nominal running time. And you can see that for lower masses, they can pin the mass down really well, because this is all this form factor stuff that we were talking about yesterday, right? So at low masses, the spectrum is different, and you can basic for different masses, and you can pin it down. As soon as you start going around 100 GeV, it starts to get murky. Um, and for, you know, a couple hundred uh, GeV, you can't really tell, right? So you basically get this big band um, on the mass of, of dark matter. And then here, they're all at 100, but they're going to lower cross-sections. And what's happening here is that here you have so many events that you can still tell the difference because the tails are slightly different, right? You have so much statistics that you can tell the difference between 100 and 500. But if you don't have enough events, then they look the same. OK, any questions on that? We, we talked about that yesterday, so hopefully that makes sense now. OK, so this is sort of, you're going to see this over and over again. You know, People are working on x, and then they have x times 10 down the line. So this is Lux. Lux is the current world uh, 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 best limit at high WIMP masses. Um, they have a 250 kilograms of xenon. Again, it looks very similar. Um, they just re um, reanalyzed their data. They're now taking a long exposure that's going to be done sometime this year. So we should expect a new result from them probably by the end of the year or early next year. They're aiming for 300 live days of background uh, let's just say background free exposure. I don't know why it says background. That's a typo. Um, so here's some data of what the, the um, dark matter search looks like. So here is basically, this is the middle of the cryostat, and this is the outer radius. And then this is Z, and they've just put all of the events into, that, in, into this plot. So these are all the events that they see. They, the, the data is, you know, gives you this amount of, of uh, you know, the entire volume. But as we were talking about yesterday, surface events are bad, right? There's always bad things that happen in the surfaces. And so you always want to fiducialize away your surfaces. And so they make this cut to look for, for WIMPs in this smaller region where things are better controlled. Then when you go down here, you see the gray events are, I think, the, the events in this outer pink box. And then the black events are the events in this uh, smaller box. And you can see that all of those events fall in the, blue in the blue region, which is the electron recoil region. They're plotting us. So here they're plotting log of S2 instead of the ratio of S2 to S1. So that's why this is shaped a little bit different. But it's the same idea. 
So this is, again, the number of S1 photons, and this is the log of the number of S2 photons. And so they have this blank region over here where they look for WIMPs. This is what they would expect if they were seeing a WIMP signal. So they would expect events equally distributed, obviously, because they're WIMPs and they're hitting you know, all of the xenon equally. And then this is what that would look like. So this is back to the question about the spectrum. Right? So this is what a WIMP signal would look like. Right, and then you, for a particular mass, and then different masses will have different distributions because that's the spectrum, right? And so, so you would go back and then look at this. If you were seeing a bunch of events here, then you would get very excited. And you would say, okay, we have a signal that's above our background, and it is consistent with a WIMP of, you know, some range of masses and cross-sections, depending on how many events you got. Yep? So they took the stuff that we did yesterday, they calculated the DRDE for that WIMP model, then they put that through a Monte Carlo of the response of their detector to say if we had such a WIMP going through our experiment, hitting our xenon target, this is what that would look like. Well, a theoretical model from the point of view that you have assumed a cross-section and a mass. And it's vanilla WIMPs. Yeah. Again, so just as we were talking about yesterday, when we're doing these things, we're just assuming vanilla WIMPs, right? Spin independent only, hitting the nucleus with a what Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, one mass, one cross section. That's it. Make sense? Just for comparison, because we need something to use, right? So we can uh, talk to each other. Okay. Yep. The Ligrate dots are events that are out here, see? Right, so, the, so you see that there's a ton of events here? These events are, bec are coming from the um, PMTs. So the PMTs are radioactive. And they try to make them as clean as they can, but they can't make them absolutely clean. So a very large background, or, or one of the main terms in their background budget for these noble liquid gases are the PMTs themselves. And the PMTs generate neutrons also, and other stuff that, because they're at the edges, they generate signals that don't fall into these means. So what this is, is a signal that gave you very little S2. So that is likely to be an event that happens really low down here and gives you a big S1 signal, but the electrons don't drift because of whatever. They might you know, get trapped in, in, the, in the surface here of the PMT. They might happen inside the PMT. You know, there's different things that can happen so that you get an S1 signal, but no drifting electrons, so you don't get an S2 signal. And so that'll give you this type of event, right, where the S2 is very small and you do get an S1. Right, but as you can see, you know, the, here's the gate grid is here and you can see that there's a ton of events there. They've just changed the, you know, this, these guys are part of that distribution. It's just that they've changed the markers so they're more visible, right? But they're just a continuation of, of crap coming up from here. Okay, so this is the result, um, and this is the best current uh, limit um, uh, over this entire range, and here's the um, boron-8 signal from solar neutrinos, so they're starting to get close, so that's kind of interesting. Now you can, uh, you can take the xenon uh, data and assume instead of the vanilla model, you can say, what if instead of spin-independent, it's a spin-dependent recoil. It has zero spin-independent component, just a strictly spin-dependent interaction. Then you can make uh, limits on spin-dependent cross-sections, assuming that it is uh, neutrons or protons, depending on what it couples to. And you know the, the um, xenon has these odd nuclei at these percentage levels, and so you can use those for a spin-dependent experiment you know, basically 30% uh, and, and 20, they, they have a, um, you know, almost 
50% uh, of their mass is stuff that will generate a spin-dependent signal if that's how it, they're interacting. You can't tell, right, because these, you see these guys don't have a little spin-dependent or spin-independent tag, right? They just generate light. You have no idea what the actual interaction vertex was. So you have to, you don't know, right? So you have to then make an assumption to make this plot. You make another assumption, you make another plot. Again, you take data with multiple targets when you are seeing a signal to figure out which of those is true. That makes sense to everybody? OK, so this is LZ. So this is the next uh, step. It's a funded experiment currently being built. It's 50 times Lux. So this is Lux's next iteration. Um, they're also going to put it in the same tank that Lux is in right now. So all of this structure exists, but the, what's in here right now is Lux. They're going to take Lux out and put this bigger uh, version of it in, which is seven tons of liquid xenon. Um, they are basically um, taking out Lux next year after they're done with the current run that we just talked about, and they're going to start installation uh, a year after that. So by some time in, in 2019, uh, hopefully they'll start taking data. Then there's a couple of other thing, other experiments. There's a Chinese experiment called Panda X. It's very similar. That's another xenon time projection chamber. Um, and uh, and you know there's a couple of other ones using uh, xenon that are being uh, developed at different places. Okay. So now there's we're gonna switch to liquid argon. So liquid argon is very similar, but they have one. In, they have two interesting. Uh, uh, differences between xenon and argon. Um, so this is the dark side program. They have this detector called dark side 50, and they're looking for funds to build a 20 kilo, uh, uh, 20 ton um, version of this experiment. So that's still a proposal. It hasn't been funded yet. So uh, we talked about these dimers earlier today. We said that there's a time constant to them, to releasing the light. But it act, there actually is two different types of dimers and they have different time constants. And in xenon, those time constants are so fast that you can't really tell them apart. But in argon, they are pretty uh, different. And the amount of the dimers, the two different types of dimers that get excited, depends on the EDX. And so it depends on whether you have an electron recoil or a nuclear recoil. And so in argon, when you have an event, you get this S1 signal we were talking about. But when you have a nuclear recoil, the photons all arrive very close packed together. When you have an electron recoil, a longer lived dimer state gets excited more. And so a fraction of the, of the light is in this longer lived, or a larger fraction of the, of the excitations go into this longer lived dimer state, which then releases light over a longer period of time. And so you get this tail. And so that tail allows you to, to discriminate an electron recoil from a nuclear recoil, which looks a lot cleaner. Okay? And so that allows you to get nuclear recoil, uh, electron recoil, nuclear recoil discrimination just on the S1 signal itself. Okay? So that's an advantage. Um, then they do the same thing. They drift the electrons. They get an S2 signal. And so then they get a difference in the S2 signal between nuclear recoils and electron recoils after the drift time happens. Okay, but you can still see that this guy has like, it's dirtier down here than that guy is, right? So you can still tell the difference just on S1. Um, so that's pretty powerful, right? That's a, that's a pretty cool de uh, uh, deal. Um, so uh, this dual face uh, TPC, um, has uh, 46 kilograms, it's called 50, but you know, uh, dark side 50, but it's got four, uh, it's, and all the rest of the stuff is the same. Now, the problem with argon is that natural argon has a long-lived radioactive isotope called argon-39. So when you look at your data, you get this huge bump of events. Now, they are electron recoils, and the discrimination between electron recoils and nuclear recoils in argon is really good. It's probably the best discrimination of any of the technologies. So they can throw all of these events out in something like 
um, dark side 50. But if they're going to build a 20-ton detector, the raw rate of events would be so high that they would just get swamped by these electron recoils and just have total, you know, they would just kill their data acquisition system. And so they have to get rid of this argon-39, mostly because of the rate. There's just too many of them. And of course, there's a leakage, and so the tail will eventually start getting into the nuclear recoil uh, range. So what they've done is they found that they, this is a cosmogenically activated um, isotope that happens when, because argon is in the atmosphere and they're getting whacked by cosmic rays. So what they've done is they started getting argon out of gas wells deep underground, where the gas has been trapped under a whole bunch of earth for you know, eons, whatever long time, you know, geologic times. And so they, it has a lot lower concentration of this argon-39. So here's data from, so this is atmospheric argon is the black line, and underground argon is the blue line. And the red line is the Monte Carlo. So that's a really interesting development. And so they've spent a lot of time looking you know, developing the ability to extract this argon from the basically natural gas. So they go to places where they get natural gas and they extract argon from the, the trace amounts of argon that there are. Um, so it's a slow process. Yes? So how did they shield it when they pick it up? Because then you're going to have, again, they couldn't make like weapons. Uh, well, but, but it takes time, right? So, and, and you only need to store it, you know, if you store it like 30 meters underground, that would be fine. Right? So you just put it down in you know, tanks and, and put it down a mine. Um, but it takes time to generate the isotopes. So, but yes, you, ha you can't take it out and then put it on an airplane and fly it around the world three times. That would not be a good idea. Um, okay, so here's the data. So now what they're plotting here is this, this S1 discriminator called F90 um, versus the uh, S1 signal. So this is basically all just on the S1 signal. So they're only they're using the TPC for fiducializing, but their data, uh, the 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 single the S1 discrimination is so good that they're only using their S1 to plot this data. And so here's uh, photons. So in in this case, the the uh, neutrons end up up here. And so this is the place where they look for WIMPs, and they get no events in that region. Okay, these are all from argon-39 and other krypton and other gammas in their system. And then, of course, they're going to go to to the bigger vat, so aiming for 100 ton years. Um, and they're going to put that in a liquid scintillator veto and that in a, so this, will, this liquid scintillator will be able to see neutrons and then in a bigger Cherenkov uh, water tank to see um, muons and other things. Okay, so again, this is a proposal, and they're planning to have sensitivity all the way down almost to the uh, neutrino floor, uh, which would be good because then you would have a second target other than xenon. So if somebody sees something, then there's more than one target available to check. And AD, um, R, um, RDM is a, another argon program, uh, European, um, that is basically trying to do the same thing with a time projection chamber. Now, you can, as we just saw, take data using just the S1 signal. So if you were going to say, well, look, we have this S1 signal, what we really want is to collect as much of those photons as possible, then the best geometry is a sphere. Right? And so there is a second type of liquid noble experiment that is, instead of building a time projection chamber, they're building a sphere and they're putting photomultipliers all over the place to try to collect as much of the S1 signal as possible. Uh, the XMAS experiment is a Japanese experiment using xenon, so they have the problem that they have a lot harder time discriminating electron recalls from nuclear recalls, because as we said, in xenon you can't tell the difference. These guys are using argon, it's called DEEP3600, uh, th uh, and they're currently starting to take data um, in, uh, in the Snow Lab uh, mine in Canada. Um, and so these guys can do the electron recoil, nuclear recoil discrimination. Then you try to use the entire uh, um, PMT signal um, and there are time differences to pinpoint where things happened inside. It's harder, but you know, it, it can, especially for smaller vessels, but, but people will try to do that. So here's the kind of um, 
uh, overview of that. So there's all of these experiments. Um, here are the current limits, and then you know all these experiments are planning to go down all the way down to the to the neutrino floor. Okay, so liquid. So the the bottom line for you guys is to remember the basics of time projection chambers, the idea of this dimers, and the S1 uh, uh, discrimination for argon. For xenon, you get this time projection stuff, and you get the S1 to S2 signal. And then they're basically operating in this high mass WIMP region. So if you know those things, you'll be able to have a discussion with, with, uh, with those guys. Yes? So because you have this time projection chamber, as we were talking about, you get some, their, their, so their uh, limit is how many photons do you get on their S1 signal? As you remember from the plots, the S1 signal is much smaller than the S2 signal. And so the bottom here is basically dictated by a couple kV recoils generating two photons. And they have single photon events, and so they can't use sing one photon as a, as a, so they're kind of, basically their trigger uh, threshold is getting two photons on S1. And so that's the, you know, and then you have to say, well, what recoil energy gives me just two photons? And, and these uh, masses down here would not generate even two photons on S1 in there. Now, they generate more than two photons, but remember, they have a, a collection efficiency. Right? They don't collect all of the photons that are generated in the S1 signal into their PMTs, right? So if they have better detectors with better collection efficiency, then they can push this down. And so that's... but. If you think about it, as you make it bigger, right, if you have a really big vat, then something that happens here, those photons have to travel all the way down to my PMTs. So as I make these guys bigger, it gets harder for them to do the low mass stuff. If you really wanted to do a low mass stuff, you probably want to have a smaller device with, with lots of PMTs. So you get that S1 signal. So, you know, trade-offs. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, I will discuss that tomorrow. Okay, so now we're going to talk about this chunk of space right here. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going slower than I should have. Okay. Um, all right, so these are the cryogenic crystal detectors. So we're looking for low mass WIMPs here. And so we have, again, things that look at just phonons, things that look at phonons and scintillation, and things that look at phonons and ionization. So all of these operate on a very simple idea, which is that you put something at cryogenic temperatures, you connect it to a refrigerator with a weak thermal link, you have some target, and you have a thermometer attached to it. When something whacks into this, it gives it some heat, and if you look at the temperature, the temperature increases and then cools back down because heat flows out through this weak thermal link, right? And the height of that signal is proportional to the amount of energy deposited. You need a thermometer, so a lot of us use these transition edge sensors, so it's a superconductor, so this is temperature versus resistance. We have a film, which is normal, with some value of its resistance, and then at some critical temperature, it undergoes a phase, superconducting phase transition and goes to zero resistance. If you bias that film right in the middle of the transition, a small change in temperature makes a big change in resistance. Right? So this is the experiment I work on, Super CDMS Snow Lab. We've gone through three generations of it, uh, you know, making the detectors bigger. So this is a funded G2 experiment now. We are uh, starting to take data in 2020. And so we have these bigger detectors. They have phonon sensors and charge sensors on each side. And um, they're larger than the previous generation. This is what our experiment looks like. It's kind of similar to the other guys, where basically we have these towers of detectors. So instead of a time projection chamber, we have each individual crystal. So our idea is to, we're going for low thresholds. So again, we're talking about size. So it doesn't help to make humongous detectors. You want a small detector that can see a small amount of energy. And so we make 
arrays of these things. We put six of them into a tower and then put an array of towers inside our detector and then put a whole bunch of shielding around it. And we have a cryogenic system here, a dilution refrigerator that cools it down, and then another stem for all the electronics readouts and things. And we're going to have both germanium and silicon detectors. So the way these guys work is you have these um, both phonon in charge on, the, on both sides. So each of these different colors is a different sensor. So it gives you a different to, to get x, y positioning. Um, and if you look closely, you see these little beads and you see these little lines. So these lines are charge sensors and the little beads are the phonon sensors. So when you look at one of those little beads, it looks something like this. So this is aluminum, which is superconducting. And that little line right there, the blue vertical line, is that film of superconductor. That's the transition head sensor. These little tabs, blue tabs, are just to connect the aluminum to the, to the little thing. So here's a zoom in. So that's the TES right there. Okay. And the way it works is you have an uh, event. It makes phonons. The phonons rattle around inside the box, and they finally hit one of these aluminum films, hits it right there, that breaks Cooper pairs in the aluminum uh, film. When the phonon comes in and hits the uh, aluminum fin, it generates Cooper pairs, the, those quasi-particles diffuse around and make it to the middle where that TES is, to this little strip. The TES is, is, is in its transition, so its gap is zero. And so energetically, when they get to the TES, they say a big, uh, well, and they fall into that well, and then they can't get out, and they thermalize in the TES and heat up the TES, and that's what gives us the signal, so we get a pulse. Okay? Um, now, the way that we're operating for the really low threshold is called the high voltage operation or CDMS light. Um, so the idea is we put a big field here, and, um, and we, when an event happens, you get electron. Uh, and holes, you know, electrons get liberated and you get the heat as phonons. Now, this is a crystal and we have a field. So in order to move the electrons from there to there, you need some to do some work, some V E delta V work. And that work goes into phonons. It, it goes into heating up the crystal. Those are called Luke phonons. So the amount of phonon energy you get is this blue recoil phonons plus whatever amount of number of electrons times E delta V you have from dragging the, the charges across the crystal. Now, look at this nice little delta V here. So if I crank that up, I can get a really large phonon signal because I'm just cranking up the delta V. So if I crank that up, I can measure, you can use the phonon sensors to measure the amount of charge produced. So I have phonon-based charge amplification. And what's a big deal about this is that currently, current technology, the charge sensors that we use are too noisy for looking for low mass WIMPs. So we want to sense really small amounts of energy. We want to be able to sense a single electron hole pair being produced. And to do that, our charge amplifiers are not good enough. But the phonon sensors are, because they're cryogenic, we can design them, very low noise. And so we're using the phonon sensors as char to measure the charge. And that's the trick that allows us to go to these really low. Uh, and so it goes, it goes back to the, your question. You, know, you, you need a couple of KB to produce two photons in a xenon uh, chamber. The gap in a crystal is you know, half of an EV. Right? And maybe you need a one or two EV to generate an electron hole pair. And if we can sense a single electron hole pair, now we're sensitive to recoil energies of an EV. And that's what makes this technology so powerful for looking for low mass dark matter. OK, so here's some details uh, about the high voltage detectors. I'm going to skip this because you guys don't care. Um, one, one point I will make is that the energy resolution of the detectors, which, depend, which basically determines how many electron hole pairs we can sense, goes with the temperature. So by lowering the TC of our devices, we can get better and better resolution. So we're planning to operate them at about 40 millikelvin, which should give us a sigma about, of about 10 EV, which should allow us to see single electron hole pairs. OK. so. Uh, here's another uh, cryogenic system. These guys use scintillation and phonons. So they have a crystal that scintillates. So these are just crystals that naturally uh, um, uh, give off light when they get whacked. Um, 
they have a thermometer here that senses the phonon signal could directly couple to the crystal and then they have a second wafer that absorbs the photons emitted by this guy and those photons turn into energy here which heats up the secondary TES. So they measure the scintillation by looking at the heat produced by the scintillators, by the photons in this second wafer. Okay? Um, and then they again do some light yield versus energy discrimination and they can see electron recoils different from nuclear recoils in their uh, system. Here are alphas which are a, a source of background and they're also slightly separated. So they look for WIMPs in this region here. But as you can see they have an issue with the alphas bleeding into their signal so they have to you know, worry about that. They're now making smaller detectors. Again big detectors are not, not good for low mass dark matter so they're making smaller detectors. They're going from 250 grams to 24 grams in their next experiment. Um, and they're planning to have much better sensitivity with that. And then the last one I'll talk about is Eidelweiss, which is kind of a, our European sister experiment. Um, and they also use these cryogenic sensors uh, with charge and phonons. They use slightly different technology, so they use NTDs instead of TESs for, the, for looking at the, char uh, at the heat, but it's very, very similar idea. And these are some projections from Crest and from our experiment, CDMS. So these is the silicon and germanium high voltage detectors. So, you know, we expect to get many orders of magnitude improvement in sensitivity with this next generation. Um, and then, you know, as this, this is a prime target for asymmetric dark matter models and that kind of stuff. So if, if that's what dark matter is, we have a chance of looking for it there. Okay, so there are other things that I'm not going to go into lots of detail in. So there are silicon CCDs, an experiment called DAMIC. Uh, there are bubble changer, chamber experiments. Um, and there are direction, directional detector experiments. So I'm just, and then there's really crazy things like using DNA or organic detectors to, uh, uh, yeah, those of you from Michigan know who I'm talking about. She's crazy. Um, <laughs> I love Katie. She's awesome. Um, so, so there's all these interesting ideas to look for dark matter um, using, you know, new things. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the details, um, but I'm just going to spend a little bit of my last few minutes um, talking about, um, when, when is this supposed to stop? Just so that I time it? Quarter. Okay, yeah, so the last few minutes we'll just talk about this. Okay, so... Um, PICO is a bubble chamber. This is a very different type of technology. The idea is you have a superheated liquid here, and the superheated liqui uh, liquid can, um, uh, if you have a microscopic place where you put a little bit of energy, you can turn the liquid into gas and make a little bubble. Right? And so here's a little bubble being made. And if you don't do anything, the bubble then grows and makes more bubbles, and the whole thing boils. Right? So what you do is you, you pressure it, into this superheated state, as soon as the bubble forms, you release the pressure so that it doesn't blow up. It won't blow up, but you know, it would get nasty. Um, and so basically the way this works is you compress the liquid, you wait for an event, when an event happens, you release the pressure, and then you kind of wait for it to equilibrate, and you, I think it takes like 30 seconds to get back into the, okay, we can take data now mode. Um, they have really, this is the DEDX thing, so they have really small, uh, little sensitivity to photons. And so here is the gamma rejection that they get um, depending on the threshold. So the probability of, um, so for, di for different targets, you basically get a very good uh, ability of, of rejecting gammas. So you have very little probability of making a gamma if you're using C3F8 and you're looking at 4 kV uh, uh, thresholds, right? And for CF3I, uh, uh, you have a little bit better, but still, this is, you know, 10 to the minus 7, right? So, so it's a very good rejection factor for gammas. And here are the uh, spin-dependent sensitivities. So the current results are from a Pico 2L and Pico 60. These are two different 2-liter and 60-liter experiments. And they have run into a lot of background issues with particulates in their, in their fluid. But they've been working on that, and they hope to clean that up. And this is the projection of where they want to get to. So if I look at this and compare it with the uh, liquid xenon and with the 
neutrino background. This is sort of the big picture for spin dependent. So this is the WIMP spin dependent WIMP nuclear cross section, either protons or neutrons. PICO is most sensitive to proton uh, spin dependent interactions, and xenon is, the, is sensitive to spin dependent neutron interactions. And the neutrino floor, remember, the neutrino floor is taking the neutrino signal and assuming that it is WIMPs of this type and seeing where that ends up in this plot. And so the uh, lines look different depending on whether you're talking about a spin dependent neutron interpretation of the neutrino signal or uh, on xenon or a spin dependent proton interpretation on C3F8, right? Where you have two different targets and so you get a slightly different curve, okay? Um, all right, and then finally, I'm going to just talk a little bit about directional detectors. This is sort of Star Trek, kind of what if we would love to do this. It's very, very hard because in order to do these things, you, you need a gas. So the idea, so here's the DMTPC uh, a meter uh, uh, cubed uh, chamber. And so the idea here is that you have some gas, and it's, again, a TPC. So it's the same concept as the xenon stuff. Uh, we have a field in here. An event comes in and hits a fluorine atom. Now, what happens is this guy recoils. It's in a gas, right? So it just goes around and goes boom, 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 and, enter, and, and ionizes a whole bunch of stuff and generates all these electrons. These electrons see the field and drift, and then they get to a, uh, a very high voltage region, which makes them release you know, the same idea as, as xenon. They release a whole bunch of photons, and then you actually image those with a CCD. So then you image where on this grid the photons came from. And so you can actually then make a picture of the fluorescing from the grid, and the, the a number of electrons that get made as a function of track length um, depends on which way the track is going. Right? This is uh, the Bragg peak stuff. And so you get a more signal at the beginning and less signal at the end of the track. And so you can get the sense or the head tail effect um, for, from, these, from this technology. And then the timing of the event gives you the position in this direction. And you can, you, they even can do the timing of these guys versus that guy so they can get the angle. So they, they get the position, but they also have enough timing resolution that they can get the angle of the track. So they can reconstruct the track in 3D. Um, and so this is really exciting technology, but they need 300 meter cube years to get a detection at one femtobarn, right? And they have one detector that they're building now. So they need 300 of them because it's gas. So there's not a lot of mass in a meter cubed of low pressure gas. So that's the, the, that's the, the issue. But so I don't, you know, I think this is not a discovery technology, but this is, you know, we're having this discussion in breakfast. The budget for dark matter is maybe at most a couple hundred million. The, the budget for the LHC is, you know, tens of billions. And what are we going to build after? If we see dark matter, uh, you know, we can multiply the dark matter budget by a, vac by a factor of 10 and still be way, way, way under the LHC budget. And then something like this becomes feasible, right? So I think this is a technology that would be very seriously considered if we had a signal and we wanted to really study it. Yep? Because the track length is very small when you're in a liquid. And so you can't, you know, the, you, the initial thing comes out, wax into, you know, other liquid particles, and then just, you know, it stays, it just diffuses, and so you just get a ball. So people are trying to do it, but it's, it's really hard to do in a liquid. Just the, the track length is just too small. Yep? Yes, so these guys, that's the whole point, is that these guys are trying to see this, you know, reconstruct tracks, and so then they would do a statistical, you know, they would, we, they would sum all their data and bin it into hours of the day, and then they would look for a modulation in the overall statistical, you know, mean direction that all their tracks are as a function of day and look for that 
changing over the day uh, over a 24 hour period nope this is the way to do it okay so this is as I said it's a it's a proof of principle um, and you need to make a big experiment I think this is a very reasonable thing to think about as a second generate you know a second a post uh, dark matter signal experiment where you see a, a signal it looks like it's a wimp it probably needs to be a heavy wimp so that it gets you enough recoil then you could think about building a big big bunch of these guys so this is sort of the and uh, the the money plot you know here's where we are and in wimp space we have this high mass region and this low mass region things continue going down this way so our experiments are going to continue to try to lower our thresholds and keep on going down. The kinematics get really hard. So at some point here, we have to switch. You know, once you get to, to MEV, you really have to switch over to electron recoils. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, but this is basically the, the, the state of, of affairs. I think this next generation is not going to get to the neutrino floor. So the next generation is here and here. Um, but we're going to be within, you know, one more, I think we have one more generation in both sizes. So, so Darwin, which is sort of a third generation experiment, and the, the, a post uh, G2 experiment in Super CDMS, we already have designs of how we can get down here. So I think, um, you know, the G2 experiments are going to get close. And, you know, we don't know, hopefully, if there's a signal right here, we're going to get oodles of events, right? We don't know. So it might be awesome, and we might be getting gajillion events with the G2 experiments. So it shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't think, oh, we're going to do G2 and then do the G3. If dark matter is here, then LZ is going to see a whole bunch of events too. So, you know, we just have to see what happens. Um, and, but if we don't see anything, then we still have another generation to go before we get to the neutrino floor. And as we'll talk tomorrow, once we get to the neutrino floor, things start to get rough. And, um, and then we have to really think hard about whether we want to go into finance or medicine or pottery or something. All right, thank you very much. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. Turn this off.